Lecture number two. Coastal processes and landforms. These are landforms created by waves. And I want to begin you know, in the first place by talking about what creates waves. And of course, it's wind. And wind provides a frictional force that pushes the surface of the water along. And so we often refer to uh, waves created in this manner as wind waves. Now, there are two types of waves. The first type of wave is known as swell. And these are waves that are found out in the deep ocean water. And they're round crested and it really just represents the wind pushing the surface of the, of the water along. All right. Now the second type of wave is known as a, as a breaking wave. And these are the waves found in shallow waters. And these are, these are the type of waves you see at the beach. And what winds up happening as the swell is approaching the shallow water, it's going to start to feel the frictional resistance with the bottom. And so this swell waveform is going to slow down, surge upward, become unstable in height, and eventually break. So not only do waves change shape right, as they approach the shoreline, they also change direction. And it's a phenomenon known as wave refraction. Um, it's the bending of wave crests as they approach the shore Again, all due to differences in the bottom topography. So that's kind of critical. Now, in order to illustrate wave refraction, I want to show you a, an irregular coastline. It's called a rocky headland coast. Uh, these are called headlands or sea cliffs. With, within the bays, you'd, you'd wind up with a beach. And we'll talk to you a little bit more about that. But what's going to wind up happening here at the bottom, we've got you know a, a parallel incoming swell wave crest and then here's another one coming on in what's going to wind up happening due to differences in the bottom topography particularly in the sh uh, probably adjacent to uh, the headland it should make sense that the offshore water will be shallow so what's going to wind up happening if you have a shallow water zone that incoming swell wave crest is going to slow down but you may have deep water areas and it might make sense that adjacent to the bay uh, where the land is still you know farther away it's probably still going to be deep and that swell wave crest is not going to be slowed by the bottom topography so that uh, swell wave crest will continue at that same uh, velocity and you're going to wind up with uh, this wave bending phenomena now wave refraction has you know major ramifications in terms of erosion and deposition along coastlines and in particular, along the uh, rocky headland coasts, what you wind up with, if you kind of take a look at where the waves are going to break and hit, right, you've got waves actually converging at the headland. Right? So you've got converging waves, and when you have that, you're going to create higher wave heights, crashing waves, and a whole variety of erosional landforms. So we'll be talking about the, the types of erosional landforms due to this high wave attack. And here's just a few examples of the crashing waves that will create these erosional landforms. Now I want to talk about what's going on in the bays. All right, it's the opposite actually. Um, if you kind of take a look at where you know this breaking wave is going to hit, just kind of you know, look at it, you know, it's kind of, you wind up with a breaking wave here, maybe a breaking wave, you know, directly, and then, you know, one in this manner. And so what you're going to wind up actually in the bays is uh, diverging, all right, of waves. And so that's going to lessen, all right, wave height. And actually in the bays, you know, it's lower wave height, and it's an area of quiet waters. And actually, you wind up with depositional landforms, not erosional landforms. And so the, the classic depositional feature found in between these rocky headlands are beaches. They're crescent-shaped beaches of varying size, and they're called pocket beaches. And here are some examples of some pocket beaches along some rocky headland coasts in Australia. There's a nice sized pocket beach here and a headland. Uh, here in Maine, there's headland coast and a smaller pocket beach. And in California, I um, mean, coastal California is classified as a rocky headland coast, even though it's famous for its beaches. And really what the beaches are, are uh, pocket beaches of, of varying size. So now let's talk about the erosional landforms that are created uh, 
you know, at, at the sea cliffs or, or, or rocky headlands. And what we've got is, you know, a rocky headland diagram, but in side view and showing the different types of landforms that will be created by retreat of this sea cliff or rocky headland. Now, you're going to find these landforms in the United States all along the West Coast. I mentioned California, but these features will continue on up to Oregon and Washington and even up into uh, Canada. And also in Maine, uh, in particularly yeah, the Northeast Coast, and maybe extending a little bit into New Hampshire. So this is where you'll find these landforms in the United States. And we will begin uh, with the erosion at the base of a sea cliff, all right? And so, you know, at about mean tide level, this is where you're going to have the breaking waves and high wave attack, high wave attack. And so that's going to be your greatest here. So what you're going to wind up is, you know, undermining the base of the sea cliff or the headland. And so you'll create an indentation called a notch or deeper sea caves that can really undermine the base of the sea cliff. And that's where we begin. So I want to show you some uh, notching uh, and, and sea cliffs at the base of some headlands in England. And so we can really kind of see the un eventually undermining all right, of these headlands. All right. And, well, the next erosional landform is a very prominent feature uh, along these sea cliffs. And it's, what it is, it's an abrasion platform. And it's a rock ramp. It's an erosional feature from the retreat of the sea cliff. And so the abrasion platform it actually goes by several different names. You can call it a wave cut platform or an ab abrasion ramp. And this is the feature we're talking about right here. Now we're going to call it an abrasion platform. And it really is kind of the same process of, you know, retreat of a waterfall. What winds up happening is, you know, that notch or that sea cave is going to undermine the base of the cliff where you have, you know, the breaking waves. And the sea cliff will come unta unstable and big blocks of rock will break on into the ocean and be carried on away. And so, you know, you're going to wind up now with the, the sea cliff retreating, you know, another sea cave and then, you know, further uh, retreat and so you you repeat the process and uh, one kind of you know, neat thing that you see along coasts um, you know it, at low tide very often you know a good portion of this abrasion platform you know is exposed and of course that's when you really see the abrasion platform and here's here's a diagram kind of illustrating the retreat of what was once a much larger you know sea, sea cliff or headland and there's a beautiful example at low tide of, of this uh, abrasion platform or wave cut platform as they have here. And here is some pictures in Australia that I took when I was there many years ago. And here's at low tide, you can see at one time this headland was much larger. And here you can see that the headland extended out, you know, further. And here again, I've got some, you know, examples uh, here out in California. I mean, you can kind of walk on out and see the tidal pools. And there's some people out there walking out at low tide. And here in Costa Rica, here's another example of an abrasion platform. And of course, they're not necessarily going to be smooth surfaces. I mean, as the erosion go takes place. And here's an, a beautiful example uh, in, along the coast of Wales. And, you know, really great example of a very broad abrasion platform. All right, a, fir, uh, a third um, erosional landform that you'll find along rocky headland coasts are arches. And these kind of make, you know, coasts beautiful. And really what it is is selective uh, erosion on the sides of the sea cliff. So you've got to have high wave attack, you know, at, at about mean tide level, you know, blasting into the rock and blasting into the joints and ultimately, you know, removing you know, the sides of the sea cliff. And so you can see nice examples here. And both of these are, you know, in England. The British Isles really do have some beautiful, you know, rocky headland coasts. And here you can see an example of, you know, sea cliff uh, and, uh, you know, the, the blasting through. And eventually we'll wind up making a an arch. And here's one out in Monterey, California that's actually detached. And here we've got our next landform, a sea stack that has actually detached from the, uh, from the headland. So let's move on to our... Next landform of rocky headland coast, and there's simply called stacks or sea stacks. And here we've got some examples here, and they can form in, in a couple different ways. They can form from collapse of an arch, you know, and so what you wind up with is just kind of the you know the legs uh, of what was once the arch, because inherently it's an unstable feature. Or you can just have selective erosion 
uh, of the headland. And maybe you might have some, uh, maybe some stronger areas of rock, again, rock structure. And so when you have a you know, retreat of a, a big sea cliff, you can have erosional remnants and sea stacks. This is a famous area here in southern Australia. They're called the Twelve Apostles, and 12 big sea stacks here. And uh, here's a, 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 uh, what's called the Island of Hoy, or the Sea Stack of Hoy uh, in, in Scotland. And that's kind of a nice example of one in the British Isles. I just want to show you some really famous ones. If you ever you know, start traveling in the world, Cabo San Lucas, you know, right at the tip of the uh, peninsula of, of California, New Mexico. And so here we've got a beautiful arch and some stacks and so these are really famous and here's another really famous uh sea stack it's actually called the needle and here's an arch here these are the chalk cliffs of normandy along the english channel and these are really easily eroded and chalk is just a, a different type of limestone and so you may see this in your in your travels these are really like i said some really famous ones all right, and so um, those are the erosional landforms of rocky coastlines, and then, of course, you've got the pocket beaches in between. Now I want to move on to sandy beach coasts that you're probably more familiar with along the, the Gulf. And, you know, the Atlantic coast is, is mostly, you know, <clears throat> beaches, you know, except for the Northeast. And I want to talk about um, the main process or the main thing that's going on along beaches and it's called littoral drift or littoral drifting. It's the main thing going on. Now, the term littoral is just a general term for something going on along coasts. And then the term drift is a general term in geology uh, for, you know, sediment. And, you know, just a general term for sediment being deposited or you know, sediment being moved. And so this is it. I mean, so here, here's the definition. It's the movement of sand along the coast. All right, that's the big process that's going on. So it's not really earth shattering. Now, there are actually two components of littoral drifting. Uh, uh, the first part is uh, in the offshore. Uh, and it's the movement of sand in the longshore current. And the longshore current is parallel to the coast. It can be quite strong and capable of carrying abundant beach sand with it. Uh, yes, and it's set up uh, by incoming refracted waves. And here we've got, well, there's wind waves here. And, you know, even though we've got a straight beach, I want you to notice next time you go to the beach, I want you to watch the incoming waves. They rarely come in parallel to the coast. Very often, the waves, even along a straight line coast, very often come in refracted. And again, it's all due to differences in the bottom topography. So probably somewhere over here, there's a, I don't know, maybe a, a cave or, you know, or a canyon, some deep area. So the, the, the wave is continuing at, you know, the same forward velocity. And then at the same time, there may be a, a bar, all right, a sandbar or something like that. And so you've got a shallow water area that'll slow the wave. And so very often, you know, we're going to wind up with incoming refracted waves. And this is what sets up the longshore current. So you can have these refracted waves coming in hitting the coast and the momentum sets up this longshore current and so if you've got really strong uh you know wind and big waves you can have a very strong longshore current i mean have you ever been carried you know you know down current if you've ever gone swimming at the beach i've been carried i mean so many times and it's like oh, i get out of the where am i you know and so you're very often called uh carried down current in the longshore current along with a lot of sand all right, and so that's the first part. Now, the second part is the sand movement actually on the beach itself, and it's called beach drifting. And it's the movement of sand along the beach by the processes of swash and backwash. And so after the wave breaks, you're going to have a, uh, a sheet of water and sand moving up the beach at an angle, all right, at the same angle as that refracted wave. And then you're going to wind up with an immediate backwash, and the backwash is going to move directly back on down. But what's going to wind up happening, about two or three seconds later, you're going to have another breaking wave and another swash that's going to interrupt that backwash and is going to carry that, you know, the sand grains down beach or down drift. 
And so you wind up with individual, here we've got individual sand grains, you know, moving in the same direction as the longshore current. There's some breaking waves and some swash and backwash. And so it, you can almost kind of see the waves coming and refracted. And so we're going to have our beach drifting, you know, towards the bottom. I want to talk about a, a really common feature uh, along Sandy Beach Coast. Uh, and it, they're, they're a, a coastal construction called groins. And there is a problem uh, of uh, coastal beach erosion. I mean, coastal erosion is, is not only a problem in Louisiana, you know, uh, particularly all along the Atlantic and even in the Gulf. Uh, beaches are eroding. You know, since the, uh, since, because of global warming and the melting of the ice sheets, sea levels are rising. And so when we have storms and hurricanes approaching coastal areas, you have higher wave attack and eroding beaches. And in order to save, you know, beaches, uh, there's been the installation of groins. And we'll start with one groin along the beach. And what it's meant to do is interrupt the movement of sand uh, along the coast in the littoral drifting, both in the longshore current and even uh, in the beach drifting. And so what you're going to wind up having, having is these coastal constructions are usually made up of, you know, concrete or big giant boulders that are installed perpendicular to the coast. And it's going to stop the flow of sand and you're going to wind up having deposition on the updrift side. But then what's going to wind up happening on the downdrift side? I mean, you're, you know, you're being depleted of sand and you're going to have, uh, erosion. And so it's the craziest thing, you know, once a community puts in one groin, you've got to put in another one to try to catch more sand and, you know, and you know, maintain the, the beach down drift and then you'll have erosion again. And so you'll never just see one, one groin. It's kind of like a catch-22 situation. It's kind of a crazy thing. And so here are a whole series of groins that are put in and you can just kind of see the deposition on the updrift side. So you can always tell the direction of the longshore current. Right. And here's another example. Uh, here's some uh, groins put in here. I was flying uh, in, the, in an airplane, and you can uh, see that you know, the updrift side here. So this is the literal drift or the longshore current. I took this picture in Galveston, kind of a pretty pitiful uh, beach right here, but they've got some groins. Here's a groin here. And so you've got a little bit of deposition. There's not much going on. But you've got a little bit of a beach here, and then you can see there's nothing beyond that groin. And then there's another groin in the distance, and I don't really see much sand there. So it's definitely a need of some uh, beach nourishment and deposition of sand to, to help that beach on out. Well, eventually all that sand, you know, moving along the coast by littoral drifting gets deposited in areas of quiet water. So let's talk about a few depositional landforms that you'll find along sandy beach coasts. And the first one is a spit or a sand spit. And it's just a finger-like extension of the beach. So, you know, when the land ends, well, the littoral drifting continues on for a while. And uh, since the land has ended, I mean, you wind up with an area of quieter waters and all of that moving sand winds up being deposited. And so here's an example of a beautiful spit. Uh, the land ended, but the littoral drifting continues. And here's, again, another example here of a nice uh, sand spit that's growing. I can see some sand bodies below the water level. Well, eventually, uh, the sand spit can grow across a bay and create what is known as a bay mouth bar. And eventually, what's going to wind up happening when you create a bay mouth bar, you're closing off a bay, and what's going to wind up happening is you're going to wind up having sedimentation in the quiet water. So maybe there's a river depositing its bed load and other sedimentation, then eventually it's going to become, you know, vegetated. And so what was once an irregular headland coast, rocky headland coast, eventually, through time, will straighten on out. And here's a beautiful example on Martha, Martha's Vineyard off, off the coast of, uh, of Massachusetts. I've got some bay mouth bars and event, the eventual sedimentation. You can see some happening here. And here, again, is in, in the same area, vicinity, up on the coast of Massachusetts, a bay mouth bar here. This is up in Alaska, actually, in a bay mouth bar. And you can actually see uh, some sedimentation from, you know, from the melting glacier here. All right. 
Okay, yeah, this is the final uh, depositional land form. It's got kind of a funny name, but it's actually, uh, it's called a tombolo, and it's an Italian name, uh, Italian word for pillow or cushion. And what it is, is a sand spit connected to an offshore island. So I guess the island here is, kind of, is the pillow. Uh, so it, it should make sense that behind an island, you're going to have an area of quiet waters and all that literal drifting is going to be deposited. And so you wind up with a sand spit. Here, here we are near Monterey, California, and they've got an observatory here on this tombolo. Here's one in Greece, of course. Um, and with all well, the Greek islands close to the close to the coastline, you'll have several tombolos there. That's a nice example. This is a really famous tombolo. It's called Mont Saint Michel, and it's an ancient uh, monastery, you know, medieval monastery. It's a big tourist attraction. And you, you here's the sand spit that's you know vegetated, and they've got a road on on the spit here, and you can see all the traffic and the tourism going on to you know visit for a day. Oh, yeah, I wanted to just show you that yeah, tombolos can be very, very small. Here we are on a Vancouver Island. Here's a little small tombolo here, you know, in a pocket beach, you know, with the headlands. And then here's a beautiful example of, a, you know, of a suburbia in New Zealand, uh, actually on a, a quite large tombolo. Uh, and so that ends the lecture.